thank you for your invitation. And also, I would like to thank Sasha for presenting Maxim's universality because I feel a complete intruder here. Uh, there would be almost no algebra, well, some geometry, and it would, there would be a little bit of physics, but completely different. Uh, I decided, so the talk is <coughs> about aspects related to dynamical systems. I didn't dare to speak about experimental mathematics, which is also part of Maxim's specialization, so I will speak about dynamical systems. And I decided to present the story on a concrete example, so I will formulate first a model problem, and the model problem is quite naive. Then I will have to present some technology which is useful for solving this problem, then I will present the solution. So the physics here, well, there is some physics here, which is solid state physics, and a typical problem here is the following one. Uh, if you consider the uh, electron transport in lattice, then it's natural to consider so-called uh, inverse lattice. So you consider the space of quasi-momenta, and the electron lives on the, const on the surface of constant energy in this quasi-momentum space, on the one hand. And on the other hand, if you turn on a magnetic field, the electron has to stay in a plane which is orthogonal to the magnetic field. So the electron trajectories are plane sections of periodic surfaces by a family of parallel planes. And the question is, what is the behavior of these plane sections? It's a classical picture. It is a semi-classical picture. Uh, we are in, so we consider momentum as periodic. So our surface of uh, constant energy depends on momentum, but it's considered as a periodic surface. And so that's the problem. And of course, this problem in mathematical formulation can be immediately reformulated in terms of surface foliation because you quotient everything by Z3, you get a three dimensional torus, a perfect compact surface embedded in this three dimensional torus, and the lines which we are interested in are the leaves of the foliation defined by closed differential one form on this compact surface. So uh, it's, this particular problem is somehow very special from the point of view of surface foliations because this, the fact that everything is embedded into a three-dimensional torus is special, so the minimal components of these foliations foliation are Mm, usually just story with holes. So let's consider another problem which leads immediately to surface foliations, also related to solid state physics. So this problem was, this model was suggested at the beginning of 19th century by Ehrenfest and, and Ehrenfest. Uh, and it's formulated in, uh, be beginning, beginning, hunt, uh, I said 19th, sorry, 20th, of course, beginning of 90th. It's 1900, something like this, of course. I apologize. But still, 100, more than 100 years ago. So it is formulated in terms of a billiard. You consider a periodic obstacles in your two-dimensional plane. So the periodic obstacles are in the, form, in the form of a rectangle. And you send a billiard ball, and you are interested how this billiard trajectory expands in the plane while it goes. It escapes, then it comes back, and uh, the diffusion rate by definition is either, well, this quantity, or you can consider the, sa the same object, well, the same number would be, can be measured as follows. Just consider your billiard trajectory for some time t, consider it as a set, and consider the diameter of this set. So take the logarithm of diameter and normalize by logarithm of the time. So this is the diffusion rate, and this old theorem, due to Vincent de Lacroix, Pascal Hubert, and Samuel Lelievre, says that the diffusion rate is two-thirds. So it's not like a random work where the rate is one-half. In the random work, you have square root of t. Here, you have t power two-thirds. So it escapes slightly faster than in a random work. And note that I state this theorem regardless what is there. So it's even because it's hyperbolic, you said, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's actually hyperbolic behavior in this case. It is not hyperbolic. It is still, no, it's not hyperbolic. So you see, it's not hyperbolic by the following reasons. Reason, if you send two trajectories very close to each other, they will stay for a very long time very close. 
So it's hmm? the center of zero, yeah. Yeah. So know that diffusion rate would not change if I will change the rectangle. So this is also a rectangle like in, well the previous one, and it's still two thirds. And I can replace the previous rectangle by a chocolate plate where we have this very narrow corridors and still t power two thirds. So the goal of the talk is to compute this two thirds, and perhaps you should give the definition of all. Yes. Uh, old will be explained at the end of the talk. It's old because um, up to a recent theorem of Eskin and Mirzahani, which will be presented at the end of the talk. This kind of two-thirds were sort of lucky coincidence. It was in some cases very, which were very special when there was a whole chain of lucky coincidences, it was possible to compute these two-thirds. Due to a very recent theorem of Eskin and Mirzahani, it became sort of a matter of technology. And this is another goal of the talk to, well, to show this technology. So everything which was before Eskin and Mirzahani is old. And starting from Eskin and Mirzahani, it's sort of a new age, absolutely, currently absolutely euphoric. Uh, well, one can change the shape of the obstacle radically, adding corners, and then the escape rate well, this diffusion rate also changes. It can be computed explicitly. Here, double factorial is just product of all even numbers on top and product of all odd numbers in the denominator. Yes, this is convex, non-convex. This is convex, non-convex, non -convex, which matters, no? Mm -mm. So, oops. I can change <laughs> it by this thing, and it's still the same, uh, the same number. So the only thing which counts is the number of angles uh, pi over 2, which defines the number of angles 3 pi over 2. I can add more complicated angles. Um, if you wish, well, it will be clear in a second what, 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 what matters here. Sorry? Disks are not only rectangles. Yeah. Disks would radically change dynamics because disks are uh, well, disks will introduce hyperbolic behavior. Ah, okay, because then you see it convex, of course. So if you see it convex, you have a question. Yeah. For the whole point, then not Yes, yes. Okay. So, first I want to replace billiard by foliation on the surface and forget about billiards once and forever. And the way one replaces billiard by foliation on the surface can be well, the, the best way to express it is to consider billiard in a rectangle. And there is a classical katok zemlikov construction, which actually comes from school Olympiads. Uh, instead of ref well, reflecting the billiard trajectory, one can reflect the table. So in this way, the billiard trajectory uh, is transformed to a straight line, and we can follow the billiard trajectory and unfold the billiard all along the trajectory, and the trajectory will become a straight line. And if we fold back this picture, we'll get a uh, This is, for example, the Mark Tepper's book, yeah? Sorry? It's, it's very school. Uh, the Mark yes. Tepper's, yeah? Yes. Uh, right, so it's before Catalog. Yeah, well. Long before Catalog, long before Olympia, and yeah. started, yeah? OK. <laughs> so, so folding back this thing, we get a trajectory in the billiard. And I colored the trajectory in four colors because at every, well, at every moment, the trajectory goes in one to one of the four directions. So these four colors correspond to four directions. I suggest to identify now, well, it's, our unfolding is too huge. Let's identify by parallel translations uh, the patterns which correspond to the same color. Then we'll have only four patterns, and then everything will be identified to a torus. And our torus is glued from four pieces of our initial billiard. And if we fold everything from the torus, we get a billiard trajectory. So we unfolded a billiard trajectory to a uh, straight line on a torus. Exactly in the same way, we can, do, we can apply exactly the same procedure to our uh, billiard with uh, well, well, this wind tree billiard, except that 
I will take four copies of the initial billiard table, which is infinite, but I have an action of z plus z on this table. Everything is periodic. I quotient over this action, and I get a straight line foliation on this surface of genus 5. So we have four tori with holes. Their identifications between the holes, the parts of the holes, are expressed by colors. So we get the surface of genus 5. Straight line foliation on this surface. And our initial problem of diffusion of the uh, billiard trajectory can be reformulated in terms of the surface foliation in the following way. We take our leaf of foliation, we take a very long piece of leaf, we close it up, we get the cycle, and we calculate the intersection of this cycle with the cycle H, which is written down here, and cycle V, and it tells you how far in the plane uh, went our trajectory and how far, how far, well, top or bottom, or how far right or left. So it's exactly the same thing. I just reformulated it in a slightly fancier way. And from now on, I suggest to concentrate on this problem. We have a foliation defined by a closed one form uh, on the surface. We want to study the behavior of leaves of this foliation, or more precisely, we take a very long piece of leaf, we close, this, close it up, we get the cycle and homology of the surface. And the question is, what is the behavior of the cycle as the leaf, as we take longer and longer piece of leaf? Uh, note that actually there is a very nice structure hidden in this picture. So our surface of genus 5 is endowed with a flat metric. Well surface of genus 5 with flat metric, of course, this flat metric has singularities. It has conical singularities, which are coming from vertices of the polygon. So moreover, so we have flat metric, we have conformal structure. So we have a Riemann surface underlying this picture. And the conform, well, the natural complex coordinate on this Riemann surface just coordinate z if we consider this thing embedded, if we consider this plane as complex plane, take coordinate z in the plane. This is the natural coordinate on the Riemann surface. And there is one more structure. Let's take the form dz. All our identifications are just parallel translations. So this form dz is well defined on the Riemann surface. So actually this picture encodes a Riemann surface and the holomorphic one form and this holomorphic one form, distinguished holomorphic one form, I forgot to say that I consider I have to choose some uh, distinguished direction, and then I have the, this holomorphic one form. Um, and conical singularities of the flat metric are exactly the zeros of this holomorphic one form. So the answer is the discrete parameter, which is responsible for these two thirds, blah, blah, and so on, is, well, in the first term of approximation is the genus of the surface plus the degree, the, the orders of this holomorphic one form. Uh, and one more, no, one more remark, which would be important in the, at the very end in the solution of, the, uh, of this problem, note that our Riemann surface has interesting group of symmetries. So one symmetry is just place everything to the right. Another, everything up, well, and then up modular 2. And actually, there is also central symmetry. So we have a group of symmetries of order 8 just directly from this picture. We'll use some of them at the end of the story. Now, let me introduce you some, well, let me present you some technology in several words. This technology is technodynamics. Let's consider just general flat surfaces with where by flat surface I mean the following structure. So we have a flat surface with several isolated conical singularities and with completely trivial holonomy. So if I take a vector and I make a parallel translation, it comes back exactly to, this, uh, to itself. One can glue flat surfaces like this from polygons where all the sides of the polygon are distributed into pairs of where in each pair the sides have the same length and are parallel. I identify them by parallel translation, I get a flat surface like this. Or if you prefer the language of, of pairs, Riemann surface plus holomorphic one form, 
this is equivalent object. I forgot to say that I have, for this flat surface, I also have to introduce, to, um, as part of the structure, I use some preferred direction. As soon as I choose a direction at some point, I can, since holonomy is trivial, I can transport it everywhere without any contradictions. Now, a very, well, there are plenty of important structures on this on space of flat, spaces of flat surfaces, or if you wish, on moduli spaces of pairs, Riemann surface plus holomorphic one form. In particular, there is a group action. In terms of these polygons, the group action is as naive as possible. You just take your flat surface, you cut it, say, by straight lines to unfold it to a polygon, put your polygon on the plane. Since you have a preferred direction, the way you put it in the plane is defined up to a parallel translation, and then just act on the plane by linear transformation. You get another polygon with the same property, you glue back the sides, you get a new flat surface. So we have the action of the group on all spaces. So they will glue together, the rings will be changed, then the the, Yes, but the fact that, so they, they still, they, yeah. So, of course, the direction and the length has changed, but the fact that these two sides are still parallel and have the same... Yeah. Why did you need the preferred direction? Sorry? Because, because if I turn... If you remove these lines, you also can consider polygons as... But it's bottles. No, it's if you just consider polygons in R2 you, and SO2 are acting that structure... But then the result of the action will depend how you put, place your, your thing in the plane. You, you would lose there. Well, canonical, canonical action. I don't know. So you have, you have the surface. The surface is it's known. It's hmm? given by the polygon in the plane. Uh, if you have a, if you say, if you put so it on a different surface. And we need the action. We need the action after conjugation only. After you will not action. No, there is an actual action. I'm looking at actual polygons or next to polygons in the R2. No, 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 but no, 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 of course it does. SL2 R acts on no, R2. No, 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 but you say it's when a polygon's in R2, you should choose the uh, up to current position, you choose the right direction. Like that. You look at it. You look forward to the action. No, but if it's an R2, if you miss the result, so it's the vertical. Uh, yeah, R2 already has a space. It will. R2 is not a two dimensional vector space. It's R2. It's okay. the coordinates. It's so, not yeah. that direction. In this, yeah. SL2 R acts on R2. I'm not taking abstract two dimensional vectors. Right? No, no. no, you take absolute surfaces as preserved direction everywhere. Okay. It's kind of vector field. Otherwise, you do the action. Yeah, but to place, to, to unfold the flat surface and to place it in R2, I can do it, if, if it's only flat metric, I can do it after, after rotation. Uh, of course, in space after... And I want to kill this uh, arbitrariness. If we take plane after the surface, the group does that. So then we need two directions. Another automatic, for example. Yes. There is flat metric, so. So here's the theorem, which actually is the background of the whole story. Yeah, I forgot to, to say that by this notation says that I can see the flat surfaces with, well, th this encodes the cone angles. All cone angles are integer multiples of 2 pi. So they're encoded by integer numbers. Or another way, if you consider that, if you prefer the language with holomorphic one forms, that's just the degrees of holomorphic one forms. So, sum of these degrees is 2g minus 2. And 1 means that I consider area 1. So, the first theorem says that the action of this group and even of the diagonal subgroup, you just contract everything horizontally and expand everything vertically. So, this action is ergodic, meaning that if you start with almost, well, you take, you take a surface by random, you apply this flow, the corresponding trajectory visit every tiny domain in the space, and also it visited with a frequency which is proportional to the volume of this domain. So another way to see this action of the group is, so. It's a real way, we have some assumption. You know, the door is not quite a way, but stage one point. In space of Tori. In space of Tori. The space of Tori is model surface. And my flow, yeah, this is a very good point. In, in, in genus one, I consider the space of all flat surfaces. This is a space of tori, and a space of flat tori with the chosen, of area one and with chosen direction. So this is 
an analog of a unit tangent bundle to the modular surface. And the flow in this case, it, it, yes, it is. Yeah, it is it. And, and, the, and the flow is, is the geodesic flow. And another way to see the action of the group is to note that locally our space of flat surfaces or this modelized space of pairs, Riemann surface plus holomorphic one form, is modeled on this uh, cohomology space. So it's a relative cohomology of the topological surface underlying topological surface relative with respect to finite collection of points, which are just zeros of the form. So we consider not only absolute periods, but also relative periods of this form with complex coefficients. And well, this thing can be represented in this way. And then you start acting on this R2 just by, by a linear group, and you get the action. And by the way, this representation also explains where does the canonical volume form comes from. So in these coordinates, we have linear vectors, we have vector space. So we have one parameter family of volume elements. But as soon as we have a lattice, and we do have a lattice considering cohomology, oops, uh, with, I, I had to put i here, z plus i z. So we have, we consider integer uh, cohomology. This gives a lattice, just choose the vol linear volume element, which assigns volume one to a fundamental domain of the lattice. And you, you get a distinguished volume element. And when I'm considering uh, surfaces of area one, this corresponds to sort of unit hyperboloid in this space, because area is represented by a quadratic expression in terms of periods, plus periods conjugate. So we confine this volume element of this hyperboloid. And part of the theorem, which was just formulated, says that the total volume of this, or hypervolume of this space is finite. Well, this is not quite trivial because the space is not compact. OK, now why I'm so excited about this theorem? Because one of the ways to see to express this theorem is as follows. Take by random an octagon like this. Well, with well, this property that sides are distributed into pairs. Then the theorem claims that if you choose appropriate sequence of times of contracting and expanding, you will approach with this, this thing will approach arbitrary closed, your preferred octagon, say regular octagon. Looking at this picture, it seems absurd, but the theorem, st the theorem is stated not about polygons, but about flat surfaces. So you are able at any point, you are right to take a pairs of scissors and cut and paste, repaste, re-glue your polygon as you wish, preserving, of course, the relations between identifications of sides. So this theorem can be formulated as follows. Combining these two operations, which, which commute, so you just squeeze and uh, push in vertical direction and use scissors in a smart way. So if you choose in a smart way the sequence of times, you can approach whatever you wish, for example, a regular octagon arbitrary close. Uh, so the first modification, of course, changes the flat structure. And the second just changes the pattern. It does not change the, the point of the moduli space. OK, now let's recall that we are trying to solve very concrete problem. We have a foliation of straight lines on such a flat surface, for example, flat torus. We take longer and longer pieces of leaves. We close them up. We construct the sequence of cycles in first homology of the surface, and we want to describe the behavior of the sequence of cycles. So let's start with the model case, which is torus. Nothing can be easier. And the way when we stop to close up a piece of trajectory can be chosen as follows. Let's take a short transversal to, to the foliation. And each time we cross the transversal, we close up the cycle and draw a vector in this homology space. Well, there is. One of the consequences of ergodic theorem says that, well, which can be applied to arbitrary surface, says that if we normalize the cycles by n, this thing will tend to a limit, which is called asymptotic cycle. And the fact that the same construction would work for arbitrary flat, well, for almost any flat surface, well, no, sorry, for, for any flat surface in almost any direction on any flat surface is guaranteed by this theorem of Kirchhoff, Mazur, and Smiley, saying that for, all, for any flat surface, directional flow in almost any direction is uniquely ergodic. So it really mimics the situation with the, well, for torus, it's in, 
Yeah, mimics the situation of the torus. Uh, and also I suggest you know, sort of uh, the way to an interpretation of this asymptotic cycle. When you have this irrational foliation on a torus, so if I take off the glasses and I look at the picture, you cannot distinguish whether it's a rational foliation or a rational foliation with an uh, angle which, which has large denominator. So morally, you can consider an irrational foliation as if it's rational along a cycle which is very, very long and which approximates this irrational foliation very well, except that, to be honest, the cycle is not integer, it's real now. So, and this is something, well, it's not only for surfaces or tori, we'll see exactly the same story in a much more complicated situation where we'll consider this Teichmuller flow on this modelized space of pairs, and it's ergodic, so we'll pretend that actually it follows very long cycle in this modelized space in a second. Okay, now, uh, suppose that yeah, suppose that we are in a periodic situation and suppose that our foliation corresponds to a uh, to a anosov map on the torus. And suppose that the foliation is taken in the direction of expanding eigenvector of this anosov map and that the transverse segment is taken in direction of the contracting uh, eigenvector of this anosov map. Well, then it's clear that this Direction is just the direction of expanding vector because if I take just any pair of integer cycles, for example, I take meridian of the torus, parallel of the torus, they correspond to these two integer vectors. I'm studying applying the matrix and very fast the images of this vector of this of these vectors and the actually the images of the curves, physical curves on the surface, they get they will get aligned along the foliation. Uh, the same is valid for this. Uh, first return cycles, because if I will consider the um, oops, if I will consider the fundamental domain of the torus corresponding to this first return map to the transverse segment, our fundamental domains wouldn't be squares. The torus will be tiled with these guys, and so each rectangle here represents the first return cycle. And if I apply my Anosov map, the whole, the torus will be mapped to itself, but this picture, so this segment will get contracted, these guys will get expanded, and we see that these first return cycles to a longer interval are mapped to, by, by, by our map, to the first return cycles to a shorter subinterval, and we know how the map acts. So it's like powers over a fixed matrix. Now, Two remarks. First, of course, there is nothing special about torus in this story. I can construct a transversal and first return cycles for flat surface of arbitrary genus. And the second thing, pretend that, well, not pre so in the, in the sim simplest situation when the foliation is the foliation, this expanding foliation of some pseudo of map, I can apply exactly the same argument and we see immediately that our sequence of cycles, of first return cycles, will be stretched along the direction of the uh, dominating eigenvector. And what is less trivial is that in generic situation, when our foliation is just any foliation, I will use this theorem of Mazur and Vich and will pretend that there is some virtual pseudo of map uh, responsible for, for this foliation, and this can be uh, really, so, the, the, the formalized. So, I can, so, this theorem says that if I stretch the surface and then cut and paste, then for appropriate times, this operation really mimics as if we're following a periodic trajectory of uh, ge geodesic flow, or if, as if we're applying the matrix of one and the same transformation many times. And so their quantitative empirical description of behavior of the sequence of cycles, yeah, I pushed, yeah, is as follows. So they stretch along some distinguished direction, which mimics the direction of the top eigenvector, but there is also 
some extra direction which mimics the direction of the second eigenvector. So in the, in the second term of approximation, all these vectors live in a two-dimensional plane, but they are deviating from, from this plane already with some uh, fact, well, as, as the norm powers, uh, power lambda 2, which is small to 1, and, and then if we... What do you mean? That is orbit of affiliation, the orbit of, of, of the loss of man. So, so when you speak about which one now? I'm speaking, so I consider one individual foliation. For this foliation, I consider the first return cycles. And these first return cycles are represented by these points and homology. And I'm claiming that these vectors behave as if these vectors are obtained by acting with some fixed matrix on sort of randomly chosen. Oh, sorry, powers of. So I take as if there exists some, uh, in some matrix which mimics a matrix of induced by an automorphism of the surface in homology. And as if I'm taking power two, three, four, etc. of this matrix, and... No, no, no. So it's the transformation space of matrix. You start the matrix by some transformation. I, I'm saying that... So I'm saying that this is the empirical... That this is the... No, 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 you use the metric in the context of the, the apply metric, you can't apply metric. Um, um, I will return to, yeah, to this slide. No, uh, yes, this slide. So here, here, here we had a foliation in direction of expanding um, eigenvector of this transformation. And it was not surprising that actually all integer cycles are stretched in direction of their top eigenvector corresponding to this transformation. What I'm claiming is that you take now arbitrary surface and you take foliation by random and this fol random. so you at random. at random sorry you take you take almost any foliation on straight line foliation on almost any flat surface. And I'm saying that if you consider this first return cycles they actually mimic this story, except that now the matrix is, mm, well, the induced, so our homology space is 2G dimensional. So matrix induced in, homo in the first homology by an automorphism of a surface of genus G would be, well, in fixed coordinates is 2G times 2G symplectic matrix. So it has more room. And I'm claiming that when, say, if you, if you, construct these vectors by a computer, the whole story is as if there is some hidden symplectic matrix which constructs these vectors as before. Well, well powers of which construct this. What do you mean power of a matrix? What do you mean what power of a matrix? Matrix. Sorry, matrix. Yeah, I'm, I'm in such a rush. When he says matrix, he means matrix. Okay, okay, okay. Now I'm Okay, let's. So this would be a solution of the problem. <laughs> of course. So this is just a formalization of what was drawn on the previous picture. And actually, so everything was already said except one thing. These numbers, lambda 1, lambda 2, and so on, which appear, which are responsible for this deviation spectrum, they have a meaning. They are called Lyapunov exponents of the Hodge bundle along the Tachmila geodesic flow, and now I have to say what are Lapunov exponents, and this would be done in, on the next slide. And the only important comment here is that uh, the fact that there is a whole flag up to a g-dimensional Lagrangian subspace in homology, which is responsible for this deviation cycle, the fact that this is a complete flag, it's two complicated theorems proved later. One of them is by Giovanni Forni and the other by Artur Avila and Marcelo Viano, and they are really non-trivial. And your theorem depends on later theorems? It was, con it was sort of conditional. So as whatever sequence of inequalities we have here, there is a corresponding flag of subspaces which mimics these inequalities. So what are the Lyapunov exponents? For, you can forget about everything which was pronounced up to now, 
Consider the following situation. Suppose you have a vector bundle endowed with a flat connection and a flow on the base of the bundle. Suppose that we are lucky and the flow is, say, ergodic. Then we can play the following game. We take a fiber of the bundle and we flow it along the trajectory of the flow on the base. From time to time, since the flow is ergodic, we come close to the initial point. We can close up the trajectory and measure the uh, monodromy of the vector. But you never said providing flat. Mm -hmm. connection. Because I don't want to be, of course, but I don't want to be dependent on the way I close up trajectories, basically for simplicity. Yeah, you're right. You're right, but in this situation, I don't need to bother about the, explaining how do I close up the trajectories. Well, because then this doesn't have a practical case, it tends to bug, which is not there. But here, here we are lucky. So, because, yeah, sorry. I forgot, so now I can formulate the multiplicative ergodic theorem and define Lyapunov exponents. So let's consider many returns close to the initial point and let's produce the following matrix. So matrix A is the monodromy after n returns, so I multiply it by transpose to get a symmetric matrix, then I can evaluate this root and the multiplicative ergodic theorem claims that there is a well-defined limit which does not depend on the starting point. And this matrix mimics sort of mean, mean, mean monodromy. It pre, it pre, in a sense, morally, it pretends that instead of a flow, we have one very long periodic trajectory and we measure sort of monodromy along this one periodic trajectory, in a sense. And the logarithms of eigenvalues of this Matrix, <laughs> matrix, <laughs> sorry, uh, of this matrix, so uh, are called Lyapunov exponents. Now, in our particular situation, the base is this moduli space of pairs holomorphic one forms plus abelian differential, or what is the same, the moduli space of flat surfaces, and the vector bundle is the Hodge bundle, the real Hodge bundle. So we associate to every surface just its homology, uh, cohomology. And the flat connection is Gauss-Mannin connection. In the cohomology of the surface, we have integer lattice, and there is the only way to transport the fibers in such a way that the integer lattice is preserved, is respected. OK, so we have, we're exactly in the same situation. We have this flow, which was just defined on the on the model A space, we have a vector bundle and we have a connection. One can measure Lyapunov exponents. And the numbers which were presented just a second ago are exactly these Lyapunov exponents. Okay. Now, I promise to arrive to numbers, so I have to evaluate them. Well, Lyapunov exponents are defined very generally. Very nice object, very important in dynamics. The main trouble with this is that Usually, it's impossible to calculate them. They're just disastrous. Well, they, they, one can sometimes, when, when, when one is lucky, one can estimate them. Well, but here, where our spa all our structures are so rich in geometry that we'll arrive to true evaluation, I need to define one more ingredient to formulate the statement about the Lyapunov exponents. So, Let's temporarily forget about this moduli space of flat surface and so on. Let's consider one individual flat surface and let's count geodesics on this flat surface. So one can count geodesics on the flat torus and... It's allowed to go to the singularity or not? No, I, I want to count regular geodesics. So if one counts regular geodesics on the flat torus, the number of closed geodesics, so of bounded length grows quadratically with length. So if you count how many geodesics of length at most one milliard, you can find it. No, no, it's up. Up, 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 up. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Up to, yeah, of course. Yeah. I, classes of geodesics, absolutely. So we get uh, the, the approximate, well, the, the number is grows, well, the number is the same as the number of primitive points primitive integer points in a disk of radius 1 million, which is 
the area of the disk times uh, pi squared uh, over six. Yeah. Yeah. The, yeah, uh, the, yeah, of course, the LS, yes. So one can do the very same thing on any flat surface. So again, of course, closed geodesics appear not individually, but appear in families. And let's count them. But this time, so be, on a torus, a family fills the entire torus. Now, if we have a closed regular geodesic, we can move a little bit to the right or a little bit to the left. There would be another closed regular geodesic like this, but at some point we'll hit a conical point. So at this time we stop. So we have a band, we have a flat cylinder filled with closed regular geodesics. Let's count them with the weight, which is the sort of the thick, well, the thickness of this cylinder in the sense that let's count them with the weight, which is the area of the cylinder. And I recall that we normalize the area of the entire surface by one. So we count the closed geodesics with weight, which is the area of the cylinder. And here's the theorem of Veach, well, which was adapted to this particular weighted count by Vorobetz. It says that if we count the number of closed regular the weighted number of closed regular geodesic on a flat surface L S bounded by length L, and then we average with respect to say entire stratum and then normalized by this L squared, the result does not depend on L. L disappears. Then, well, this, no, no, I average S, sorry, this is a family of flat surfaces. Well, form, more formal theorem is for any SL2R invariant family of flat surfaces, you measure for each flat surface this number and then average with respect to all flat surfaces in this family. Then the only parameter which, since we averaged with respect to S. Doesn't depend on the first L. Yeah, yeah, there are two different Ls, sorry. Yeah, that, that was very, yeah. This, this L is a family of flat surfaces in, in, well, say like this one. Calligraphic letters are always brothers and sisters of this thing, who are SL2R invariant. So this constant is called Ziegelwich constant. And by the way, uh, this quadratic asymptotics, the, this, the same constant appears in quadratic asymptotics for almost all individual flat surfaces in this family. But what I need is this theorem, because um, this theorem suggests how to compute this number. You see, since it does not depend on the bound of the, for the length of trajectory, Initially, this theorem was designed for, for bound which is large, but nobody prevents us from taking a bound which is very small. Let's replace this L by a tiny little epsilon. The theorem is still valid. Now, well, L, L, S was either the length of surface or an it, It's the bound for the length of trajectory. We're, we're counting how many closed geodesics of length. What is, what is L again? This, uh, regular L is the bound for the length of geodesic. We are counting how... Yes. At most L. At most L. At most L. At most L. Yes, you are right. For most of flat surfaces, if I put as a bound epsilon, I just get zero. There are no short geodesics. So there are some surfaces for which we will be lucky, and there is sort of a bottleneck where we'll find one short geodesic, and, they, and, the, and this is rare. And there would be even less flat surfaces for which we can find two short independent geodesics. So, but remember, we normalize here by 1 over p epsilon squared now. So I'm claiming that one can forget about surfaces where there are two or more ind independent short closed geodesics. And basically, this integral is reduced to the volume of the part of the space of those surfaces where one can find at least one closed short ge geodesic. Now, in this, the structure of this part of the space of flat surfaces is like this. We have several sort of reasonable, reasonable flat surfaces joined by narrow long cylinders. And this 
enables to evaluate the volume of the space because it's more from this picture it's already clear that everything which we reduced to products of volumes of moduli spaces corresponding to this sort of thick pieces with some combinatorics involved so this combinatorics can be done and one can evaluate this Ziegelwich constant and it's really uh, an expression in terms of volumes of this adjacent strata of flat surfaces normalized by the volume of the initial strata with some explicit combinatorial factor which is a rational number which can be calculated. It's some combinatorics but it's doable. Also, so combinatorics is explicitly described. Volumes are fortunately calculated by Eskin and Akunkov. So for holomorphic one forms, this constant can be computed in, in for, for, for all small genera. There is analogous story for slightly more general flat metric with almost trivial holonomy. They correspond to quadratic differentials. There, there is a problem. The, vol the, vo the volumes are not computed as numbers. But let's stay for a while with holomorphic one forms. So here's the formula for the sum of these G Lyapunov exponents. It's this simple-minded expression in terms of degrees of zeros of holomorphic one form plus the Ziegelwich constant normalized with pi squared over three. So this thing, well, it's already there. This thing can be computed. So this uh, Lyapunov exponents could be computed. Now, just a word about the proof. It's based on the initial Maxim's observation that uh, an average with respect to a circle uh, in the Tehmelo space, which corresponds to orbit of this SL2R, uh, of the, well, of the, so, sorry, variation, I forgot to, to, the word variation of norm over Lagrangian subspace, does not depend on the Lagrangian subspace. And this is an enormous simplification. It reduces the whole computation to the compute, well, to some integral over the moduli space, and then computation of some integral which il involves the curvature of the uh, this time holomorphic Hodge, Hodge bundle, and then one have to struggle with analytic Riemann-Roch theorem, uh, compare asymptotics of determinant of flat metric and underlying hyperbolic metric uh, when the surface degenerates, apply some cutoff and get this formula. Yeah, 130 pages and 15 seconds. That's the, my personal record. Uh, okay. Uh, now we arrive to nowadays. A very recent theorem of Eskin and Mirzahani says that, well, everything which I told are applicable to this SL2R invariant submanifolds. They claim that the orbit, any SL2R orbit in this space of flat surfaces, the closure of any SL2R orbit is a nice orbifold. This is a miracle in dynamical systems. When you consider closures of orbits in dynamical systems, you get just arbitrary complicated objects of irrational Hausdorff dimension and so on. And here, this theorem mimics theorem of Ratner for the orbit closures of unipotent flow. It, and do we know that the moduli space is not homogeneous. No, not unipotent, generated by unipotent. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I, I was too fast, yes. Well, OK. So the development of this story, yeah, and I did, I, sorry, I forgot to say about this. Moreover, in the cohomological coordinates which I represented, these invariant suborbifolds are just affine subspaces. And not arbitrary affine spaces, I just don't have time to describe them, but there are plenty of constraints what affine spaces can, in principle, appear as orbit closures and SL2R invariant manifolds. So this theorem, uh, before something like this was already known in genus 2 because in genus 2 there is a classification of all SL2R invariant manifolds due to Kurt McMullen, but genus 2 is very particular and nobody knew before this theorem whether it was something specific about genus 2 or not. No, it's not. So this is a general theorem. Uh, 
Another development is that there are really efficient methods of constructing orbit closures. Another recent development says that for any given flat surface, it's really, so this theorem generalizes this theorem of Kirchhoff, Mezu, Smiley, Smiley, saying that for any flat surface, almost any direction is uniquely ergodic. This theorem says that for any flat surface, almost any direction is Lyapunov generic. And this shows what is now, what should be the technology of trying to understand the topology of any, uh, sorry, of any flat surface. So you take any flat surface and you want to understand the behavior of a directional foliation in almost any direction. So the technology is as follows. Apply this theorem, so push the button and find the orbit closure. It is really, with all this recent development, it became a technological question. So you just have to work hard. As soon as you found the orbit closure, you have to calculate the Lyapunov exponents for this orbit closure, and this is the answer to all of your questions. Now, in the wind tree problem, there was extra lucky coincidences. Uh, one can notice that our flat surface with the, with, 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 is a cover of a surface in the hyperelliptic locus in genus one, and that this sorry, the cycles H and V, which we're interested in, are coming from this genus one. Uh, now, you apply this technology and you prove that the orbit closure of almost any wind tree surface is the entire hyperelliptic locus. And then, since it's in genus one, the sum of expo Lyapunov exponents is just one Lyapunov exponent. You compute it, you get two thirds. You, 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 if you consider this wind tree flat surfaces with more complicated shape. There is another hyperelliptic locus. You compute all the same. You find Lyapunov exponent. You get this number, which was there. Now, I still have several minutes. I want to present one application. I will skip the other one. I want to compute the volumes in genus 0 for quadratic differentials. So I suggest to consider slightly more general flat surfaces in the sense that for a flat surface like this, the holonomy is already in the group Z over 2Z. But otherwise, it's the same. But I want to restrict myself to genus 0. And, by the, and we, we have seen that computing volumes is actually equivalent to computing, well, the number of the volume of the moduli space. I want to compute the, vol the volume of the moduli space of flat surfaces like this. So g to zero and, say, three singularities, conical singularities with an angle like this. So it depends the volume, what kind of volume? You say it's a stratum in there. Yes. So for each stratum, I have these cohomological coordinates, which are slightly more complicated in this case. Yeah. Yes, there are special coordinates of volume. Like yes, that. yes. And, and basically, I'm, I have to count the number of integer points in a huge ball in this cohomological coordinates, which is equivalent to counting how many flat surfaces tiled with, say, one zillion squares, and with this singularity data I can find connected. So, and as a matter of fact, for genus zero, this is, a, this is counting Hurwitz number with the ramification data like this. This guy is, so yeah, that's another several words. So here's the guy. <laughs> And it's not me who did this guy. It's Maxim, actually. I cannot help telling the story. We were desperately counting these volumes uh, using some combinatorics, relating some terrible sums to multiple zeta values, then using Don's wonderful code for relations between different multiple zeta values to find the final answer. And at some point, it was in Bonn more than 10 years ago. At some point, Maxim comes to my office and says, oh, I found this thing in Pupinskönig, I guess, close to their train station. One can really create, one can construct them. And another story which I want to tell is that, well, it was in my, we did this thing. It was in my office, and at some point, uh, we brought the family of, I, so, so pro, no, probably I brought the family of my colleague uh, to Max Planck Institute to show how mathematicians work. So there was the son, the three-year-old son of this colleague, and a friend of his wife. And the son said, oh, I know now what mathematicians do. 
And the friend of the wife of my colleague who was an artist said, oh, I had it in my childhood, but I, I never had an idea that one can construct volumes. I always did flowers which were flat and so on. And I'm telling this two story, well, two, 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 two things because to my mind this really characterizes the way Maxim does mathematics. First, it's really the way he, he does mathematics. He plays with it like, no, well, you, you started it. Yeah, I just finished. Yeah, you started it. And so he really plays like, like a kid and he sees things which other people do not see in which are just behind them and well he creates well so this thought of things out of of nothing and working with him it's like broad well what it's supposed to represent it's yeah it's square tile surface it's square tile surface it's an integer point well okay rectangle tight yeah it's integer point in this space so basically, counting volume is equivalent to counting how many, so you are given one milliard squares like this, how many connected surfaces you can construct using at most one milliard squares, having exactly these conical singularities. Yep. So. And you have a species of Maybe go on, yeah. Yeah. So let's. For quadratic differentials, there is a similar formula for the sum of Lyapunov exponents. Let's apply it to genus zero. In genus zero, uh, there are no first homology. So on the left-hand side, we just have zero. The sum is equal to zero trivially. So we get a relation between the Ziegelwich constant and this expression just for free. We have this expression for Ziegelwich constant. On the other hand, one can use the expression uh, for the, yeah, sorry. Now I will tell the answer and then, then the solution. So let's define the following function of an integer number n. It's double factorial of n divided by double factorial of shifted n, corrected by power, pi power n, and corrected by this last factor. And let's define by definition double factorial of minus one and of zero is one. Then Here's the formula for the volume of strata of meromorphic quadratic differentials with at most simple poles in genus zero. Uh, just the product of these guys evaluated at di's. So he, Maxim conjectured this formula about 10 years ago uh, using approximate values of Lyapunov exponents computed by computer and looking in this particular case and then making a guess for a general case. And yes, this guess is true. And to prove this guess, you use this formula for the Ziegelwich constant and the expression of the Ziegelwich constant in terms of volumes. So you get series of relations for the volumes. And to prove that the, the formula for the volumes, it's sufficient to plug in the guessed formula in this thing and prove that the relations are really true. This is some combinatorics uh, which, which can be done. So here are the relations. And one have to write down general, uh, well, uh, generating function for this thing. This is, and th the generating function for this sum and for this sum is the same. And this is, one, one does not obtain this relation on the nose, but using some functional relations between uh, these functions, one can prove this. This I will skip with it, yeah. So this is a description how the computation sort of fails trying to, to make computation honestly. The Lyapunov exponents were not designed to compute volumes. Everything goes vice versa. The volumes were supposed to be used to uh, compute Lyapunov exponent, and it was just in a protocol how we tried to generalize Maxim's combinatorial results, uh, well, in, to, to, to compute volumes honestly. Uh, and this is just a list of, of problems which, with which I want to, to finish. So there are plenty of, well, th there is this brand new theorem of Eskin and Mirzahani and all the results of it, but now the question is what is, whether it's possible to make a classification of a Saltor invariant 
submanifolds, and it's really very interesting. Uh, and there are recent indications that there are non-trivial, interesting SL2R invariant manifolds, the origin of which we do not understand currently. And another thing is, well, there are plenty of problems. Well, it's another thing is, say, to compute volumes when genus tends to infinity. There is when genus is, well, finite genus, even for abelian differential, the formula of Eskin and Kunikov is rather an algorithm how to compute. It's not a, a compact formula. For quadratic differentials, it's even more complicated. But it looks like when genus tends to infinity, there is enormous asymptotic simplification. And there is a confirmation for the principal stratum. It's confirmed in recent work of Dawei Chen, Martin Muller, and Don Zagir. Well, and also it would be interesting to do everything, not analytically, but algebraically. It would be great to compute the Zigelevich constant, for example, to find an interpretation of it in terms of some intersection theorem, which is probably not constructed yet, say, like ELSV formula, or something like this. And finally, one more problem is to study dynamics of the Hodge bundle of other families of compact uh, complex varieties. And some experimental results for families of Calabi Yaus are already obtained by, obtained by Maxim. And another thing which would be extremely interesting it to, is, would be to go backwards. So here, we started with billiards, and we find, found an interpretation in terms of moduli space of well, curves. It would be funny to start with some moduli spaces of complex varieties and to go back and to, to, inter well, to find an interpretation relation with some renormalization of uh, simple-minded dynamical systems like billiards. So thank you for your attention and congratulations from the entire billiard community to Maxim.